Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here today uh, interviewing uh, someone who is a local hero as far as I'm concerned because of all that he did to protect us and ensure that we enjoy the freedoms uh, that we do today because of his sacrifices in the Second World War. Now, would you please tell everyone when you were born? I was born on the 21st of January, 1922. So in January, you'll be 99. Correct. Tell me when you signed up for the forces. I got my calling up papers to, uh, you know, start, uh, towards the end of 1941 and then had to go for uh, an RAF uh, air crew. Because I volunteered for the RAF and air crew. So I had to go to, pa I think it was Padgate, uh, in I think November of that year mm -hmm. for a medical and a educational assessment to see whether I was fit for air crew and then I actually was called up on the last uh, Monday a beautiful day like today in June 1942 and I reported to the air crew receiving centre at Lord's Cricket Ground and that was a thrill for me because I was always interested in cricket as am I and at the end of my navigation course I had the I was pleased to say that I was the top cadet and I got that's why I got uh, uh, promoted to an officer straight away. Every flight I did in the RAF until I was demobbed is in that uh, logbook. Goodness it's wonderful. got all my operations etc. John on behalf of a different generation I would like to thank you and all your colleagues for the enormous sacrifices that you made in the Second World War. But because without what you did, we wouldn't be able to live and enjoy the freedoms that we do today. Okay. So I'm going to applaud you. Thank you. I appreciate your thoughts. And to me, it's an honor to talk to you. Bless you. Again, don't know where, don't know where, but I know we'll meet again some sunny day. It's my food, just like you. gentlemen I'm delighted to have with us in our program Dame Vera Lynn's daughter Virginia better known as Ginny <laughs> and as we all know it was only last month that she lost her dear mother uh, and be on behalf of everyone I just want to say Ginny um, it must have been tough because you didn't only love your mother but you had to share her with everyone else. So I, on this very special day, the 75th anniversary of VJ celebrations, just before talking about your, your, your mother's involvement and her experiences, would you just give us a, a tiny insight into what it was like living in this wonderful family with Harry and, and Vera? Well, it's so difficult to answer that because having been born into it, it was almost sort of, uh, second nature I mean it was it was it was there I was always in that milieu and so I didn't know what it was like not to be 
Uh, so as far as I was concerned, I suppose I just took it all for granted. That's what happened and that's what happened. <laughs> When did you first realise, though, that you didn't have just ordinary parents and that your mother in particular was a national and international star? What, what really brought it home to you? Well, as again, it's the same thing, really. Because she always was and because I was always me and Daddy was always who he was, um, I just grew up with it and accepted it for what it was. It didn't come as a blinding revelation. It was just always there always knew that she was a star and he was the uh, man behind the throne, so to speak. And, and, um, uh, and also very active on her behalf and on his. And it's just, it was just always there. Uh, they were just always there. Well, I know how close you were and that your mother was very proud of all the support that you gave her over the years. So turning now to VJ uh, Day, your mother said over and over again, that she felt our boys in the Far East were forgotten. So yeah. can you explain what, how, how she felt that, please? Um, I think that, um, you know, everybody, a lot of artists were going into Europe or, or uh, uh, even as far as uh, India, the Ensa people, but um, nobody was going farther than that. They were all very, um, uh, not frightened but wary I think of going forward in fact when mummy said that she wanted to go to Burma to see it well the forgotten 14th as we know um uh the and en so people said well we can't take responsibility and handed her over to the army <laughs> so it was the army who looked after her uh but she felt she had a responsibility to go to Burma to help you know bring a bit of cheer to the boys over there Ginny reading the book though is it true that your mother had never been in an aeroplane yes. and that she suffered from seasickness? Yes, yes. Well, it didn't help really, considering that she was in a, uh, a flying boat um, for part of the journey. So she had a double whammy, really. <laughs> and, and did she share with you what, what the, the, the weather was like uh, when um, she was in the Far East? Oh, yes. Very hot, very humid, perspiring all the time. Um, her lovely dress she took to wear at concerts she wore once, got drenched in perspiration and was suggested by one of the squad is probably not to wear it again because you could see everything underneath. <laughs> <laughs> but she stuck the khaki after that. <laughs> but Ginny, I, I don't understand. How, how did she take her pianist and a little piano with her? Well, no, the piano they sort of adopted when they were there. Oh. Um, but uh, they trundled around on a truck with this piano in the back but uh, at one point uh, one concert when they arrived and the piano was 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 uh, put onto the stage and Leonard sort of you know uh, tried it out on one thing and then the, fa the sides fell off because of the terrible state of the roads and the sides of the piano just fell off so two of the of the, uh, of the boys had to sit on the stage holding the sides of the piano on. <laughs> And did, did your mother share with you the sort of conditions that the troops actually had to live in? Oh, yes. Well, as I said, very hot, very humid, lots of dysentery uh, around and other malaria, etc. Um, very, very uncomfortable conditions. But, you know, they just literally, to coin an expression, soldiered on and did what they had to do. Um, and they just accepted it uh, and just got on with it, basically. But it, they were horrendous conditions. And I understand, again from the book, Ginny, keep smiling through, that your mother just didn't entertain them. She then went and visited uh, the troops who were injured and yes. very stressed out in the hospitals. Did, yes. did, did, did she tell you about those experiences? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, and, you know, it's common knowledge uh, that she went to all the hospital tents when she could uh, and spoke to the boys and um, chatted with them. In fact, one of the letters was from somebody's, I think it was daughter at that particular point, who said that her father uh, had to have bandages over his eyes because of his injuries. Um, and so he couldn't see my, my mother. But actually, afterwards, he regained his sight. It was that they were okay. It was just that they had to be well looked after. Um, and that was when he found out. And then there was, found out that there was a photograph taken of him and my mother sitting on his bed uh, in one of the tents. So he was thrilled to bits. 
Good grief. Now, when it was all over, uh, did your mother say how she celebrated the end of hostilities and victory over Japan Day? Well, I think that was when she was in uh, East Ham and uh, they were uh, in the garden with her grandmother uh, and her mother and father, obviously, listening to the radio uh, when they realised that the war was over completely. I think they just had a cup of tea and a bun or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and a glass of sherry. Sorry, Tom just reminded me. They had a glass of sherry. <laughs> so of all your mother's songs... Did, did she say which was her favourite? Because I can remember her talking about we'll meet again and it was yes. just a fluke really, the way it happened. But did she yes. have a particular favourite song? I don't think she did, no, not really. I think, you know, she appreciated we'll meet again for doing what it did, not only for her, but for the country. Um, so in a way, that was probably her favourite song. But overall, I don't think she had one. She only ever had sang songs that she wanted to sing yeah. if she didn't like a song she wouldn't sing it if somebody presented her with something she said no I don't like that she wouldn't do it <laughs> so really um all the songs she sang were songs that she enjoyed singing so I don't think there was anything particularly apart from that as I say which of course she appreciated for what it did well your mother had a wonderful voice an extraordinary yes. voice yeah. and uh, what a life she's lived a uh, 103 years and my goodness she didn't have it easy but she lived a long life and she's given love to her own immediate family but she's given love to everyone in the united kingdom and the whole of the world so yes. Ginny, thank you so much for being with us today i really appreciate it will you just tell all our viewers why you think the 75th anniversary of vj day is so important because it did mark the end of hostilities completely. Um, it was, it meant that those boys that were out in the East and everywhere could come home eventually. There might have been a skeleton staff, so to speak, keeping an eye on things, but on the whole, everybody could come home. And um, it was extremely important for, once again, everybody's morale to know that they were eventually at some point going to go home and they could go back to their families and um, uh, see their children, some of whom had never, had never seen the children that were being born because they were away for so many years. Uh, and, and just generally, it's, it's just so important for people to realise that that was an extremely important uh, uh, day in, 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 in an epoch. Well, thank you so much, Ginny. Uh, thank you for the time you spent with us. And thank you. wherever your wonderful mother is now, but I'm sure it's in heaven, God bless her until yes. we meet again. I'm standing outside the Ministry of Defence by this wonderful Chindit Memorial, which commemorates the Chindit Special Forces who served in Burma in the Second World War. The Chindits were formed for raiding operations against the Imperial Japanese Army, especially long distances behind enemy lines far away from direct contact with friendly forces. They were very brave. Their operations often included prolonged marches through extremely difficult terrain. Four men of the Chindits were awarded the Victorian Cross, the highest and most prestigious award for valour in the face of the enemy that can be awarded to British and Commonwealth forces. Those men were Major Frank Gerald Blaker, Captain Michael Ormond, Lieutenant George Albert Cairns and Rifleman Torba de Hardimer Pornick. This memorial was erected in 1990 and you can see that on the top of the memorial is a mythical creature, Klinthe, a guardian of Burmese temples which the Chindits are named after. I believe this is a very fitting memorial.
hello, I'm um, Sally Ryan and um, I'm talking to you today uh, in relation to my grandfather, it's my maternal grandfather and his name was uh, Robert Peaty, so Major Robert Peaty um, and he was part of the Royal Army Ordnance Corps um, and was a prisoner of war in Japan through the Second World War. Um, well, he lived in St Cross, uh, which is a small village just outside Winchester, and um, really he just was very lucky. Um, they had a, I suppose, what we'd call sort of classical middle class upbringing. Um, family went into um, the army, um, so he spent a lot of time with his brother Frank. Um, they used to sail a catch on the Solent. I live near the Solent now, so um, that's kind of quite nice to have that little bit of connection. He also um, was very musical. Um, he absolutely loved his music and he had a whole massive collection of old 78 records that I remember as a, as a small child. Um, but he played in an orchestra as well. Um, and at one point he made a record uh, back in the day, um, which was for children and it was to help them identify the different instruments within an orchestra. And he played the bassoon. So. He was a major, um, so he was mostly based down at Didcot um, in the Oxfordshire area. The, the role of the Royal Ordnance um, was to look after the sort of supply and maintenance of the, of the supply chain, um, kind of going down through uh, to the front. So uh, their role was kind of weaponry, munitions um, and other sort of military equipment. So he was responsible for kind of organising that. He was a great organiser. Very. <laughs> so uh, more um, of, if you, I suppose you would call it a, a sort of administrative based role within the ordinance because that was the function of the unit. Um, so, uh, he was captured at the fall of Singapore, which I believe is February 42. So, um, you know, relatively early on in that sort of Far East campaign. Um, and he was then uh, marched through to Changi and he was um, on some of the hell ships and he eventually ended up at the Mukden camp, um, which was where Unit 731 um, was it's quite a notorious unit. They did a lot of, the Japanese did a lot of biological warfare experimentation um, on POWs um, and he remained there until the end of the, uh, the war in Japan. It is quite difficult because there's a few uh, different things um, and I know we've talked about that a little bit. Um, I think he, he would probably appreciate that his biggest achievement was getting a vast majority of his men home at the end of the war um, but the way in which he went about doing that um, kind of leads to a few different stories so even on the march um, from the fall of Singapore he was very mindful that they needed to uh, gather together uh, anything that might be of use um, so one of the things he did is he found an old door panel um, and he picked a couple of those up he actually carved their regimental badge um, out of one panel and mounted it on the other panel. Um, and uh, the Japanese, as I understand it from, from family sort of stories, he didn't talk about it much after the war, but um, the Japanese kind of respected the fact that he uh, took such pride in his regimental uh, badge and, and code of honor. Um, what they didn't know is that he'd carved the back out and he'd smuggled some dollars in the back of it that he took into camp. He used those dollars to um, uh, not only uh, get uh, a small uh, sort of box made, which he wanted to bring back for my grandmother, um, but also to buy newspapers and, and items from uh, local villages when he was uh, in camp so that it could make life more comfortable. Um, and also to get information. So he learned Russian and Japanese so that he could read the newspapers so he could pass the information on. Um, but the biggest thing was he kept a, a diary all through his internment, which um, obviously had quite a, a risk to it at the time. Um, but his forethought was that whatever happened to him um, and within in camp uh, was very much about uh, having some record, uh, not only of the people, but also of the, uh, the people that he met uh, 
as officers and commanders of the uh, the camp, which varied. Um, and then that became evidence, uh, as I understand it, for some of the war crimes uh, tribunals that happened um, after the Second World War. So that, I believe, his diary is still in America. Um, and it would be fabulous. It's kind of like one of the things I'd love to do is, is kind of regain that and have that back in the family, you know, with sort of lifted embargo of uh, 50 years. Um, but I think that it, it definitely helped in terms of some people within um, the officer units and the serving units on the Japanese side were simply doing their job as, as unpalatable as that was, that, that was their role um, and, and what they had to do within their army. Um, not that that at all, you know, sort of nullifies the, the, some of the actions themselves that we would find barbaric. It, there was also a, a cultural issue there, which my grandfather tried to understand, um, even if he didn't agree with it. Um, but he did actually also want to ensure that the, the few people that he understood to be really abhorrent in their behaviours, their attitudes, their beliefs, um, their retribution against the POWs, that, that there was some degree of uh, correct naming of those individuals so that they could be brought to, to justice um, yeah. after the war. Um, he... Uh, his attitude to the war, he never held a grudge against the Japanese people. Um, as I say, he learnt as much as he could about their culture to understand why uh, certain things happened. Not agree with it, but, but understand. Um, and that he was very specific about certain people, um, you know, that he's obviously named in his war diaries, um, just to... They were... Um, evil. Uh, if, if you listen to any of the audio tapes from uh, the Imperial War Museum, it's the only time I've ever heard my grandfather swear. He's referring to a couple of these people. Um, and uh, that, that was really significant for him. You know, that, was, that wasn't sort of uh, said or done lightly. My grandfather, uh, when he uh, came back and after he was um, demobbed with, with many uh, hundreds, thousands of other uh, military. Um, he found a job with the American Embassy in London. Um, he was part of the Treasury Department, um, but then he later moved over to work in the same department um, in the Embassy over in Paris. So he carried on kind of working within that public service role, uh, if you like. I will probably do it uh, quite quietly. Um, I live on the Isle of Wight um, and I'm, I'm not aware that there's a huge population um, around BJ Day that, that it has particular um, sort of prominence for, for them in terms of their own family histories. Um, so probably a little bit quietly, a little bit reflectively. Um, I have a favourite beach uh, which is often where I will go for particularly special reflections. So I think probably a walk down there overlooks the Solent, um, so I'll be thinking of him sailing his catch uh, just around the corner, <laughs> around the needles. I suppose my finishing note, because because we only stand by the legacy we leave, um, you know, uh, after our our sort of life. Um, and I know that my mother spoke to a fellow POW at my grandfather's funeral, as I say, it was about 30 odd years ago. Um, uh, and I feel quite emotional at this. Uh, the POW said to my mother, um, he always remembered that your father never had a bad word to say against anyone. Um, and I think that's, that's a lovely legacy to leave. is the story of my father Gerald Peters. Uh, my dad was 20 in 1939 and that was the age when people of his age were conscripted into the army as war was threatening. He joined the Royal Engineers 560 Field Company and the early days of the war he spent first of all mining the beaches in Norfolk as part of the coastal defence plan. And then uh, as bombing intensified at Britain, he was sent to Liverpool where his unit helped the fire service put out the fires uh, from the intense bombing of, of Liverpool. And then in October 1941, they were told they were going overseas. 
they were one of the first convoys to be protected by the Americans across the Atlantic. They went to Halifax, Nova Scotia, joined up with other ships and then went down to Trinidad, Cape Town, Mombasa and spent Christmas 1941 in India. It was there that they learned that they were going to be diverted to Singapore. They all had desert camouflage. They were uh, going originally to Basra in Iraq. They arrived with the 18th Division. They were the last convoy into Singapore and their first and only job was to blow up the port and all the facilities there. Dad was captured and uh, spent initially at Changi prisoner of war camp uh, where he helped design and build the Lich Gate, uh, the entrance to the cemetery that the prisoners built and which is now at the National Memorial Arboretum in Staffordshire. Uh, later on in 1942, he was in one of the early groups that were sent to the infamous Thai Burma Death Railway. Uh, they left Singapore in October 1942, and he spent the next uh, 18 months working up in terrible conditions. Many of his friends died of starvation, of tropical diseases, of beatings by the vicious guards. Uh, but Dad was one of the fortunate ones. He survived. He spent most of his time at a, a camp called Tarso, where he uh, helped build the Hintop Viaduct and Hellfire Pass, which are still in use today. Then, um, when the railway was completed, he went back to Singapore, and as he was one of the fitter ones, he was selected to go to Japan as essentially a slave labourer. He went in one of the hell ships. Many of these were sunk by American submarines because they had no markings on them showing they carried prisoners of war. He got to uh, Japan and in July 1944, he started working at a sulfuric acid plant, uh, again in very bad conditions. Um, and of all things, they had a severe earthquake. He said it was one of the most terrifying moments of his life. Uh, the sulfuric acid plant was destroyed. Luckily, they survived. And he spent the last couple of months of the war uh, working in a, in a steel plant, again, in very poor conditions. He was liberated by the Americans. A piece of the parachute that was dropped on their camp uh, with food supplies uh, signed by his friends uh, he kept and is now on display in the Kofi Po Memorial Building at the National Memorial Arboretum, as is his mess tin, which was inscribed with the Royal Engineers uh, badge, and that's at the Memorial Arboretum as well. Um, Dad then uh, the, liberated by the Americans uh, initially to Manila, then to Vancouver, right across Canada and back home again to Liverpool. And um, he literally, as the title of a little book he wrote later, said he walked to the station, went round the world and walked back again. Um, Dad's parents knew he was a prisoner of war, um, but all they had from him in all those years were six pre-printed Red Cross postcards, very basic information, I am well, I am working. They kept those and, and I still have them now. Um, when Dad came back, um, he went to the same company, Spicer Stationery, which he joined at the age of 16. He started on the shop floor and uh, progressed to be production director. He stayed there until he retired at the age of 63. Um, he didn't talk about the war um, when he was working, when I was growing up. Um, although he did have an annual reunion, which he cherished with his friends from the 560 Field Company. They met every year in Great Yarmouth. 
but they kept it to themselves. They didn't really talk to us. Although I do remember we never had Japanese cars. We never had a Japanese television, nothing Japanese in the house. And in his work career, he bought a lot of machinery from Germany, visited Germany, frequently had friends there. And he said to me, my war was with Japan, really. Um, he didn't, he wouldn't have anything to do with Japan, but Germany, he was fine with. He called his house Yasmi, which was the Japanese word they really wanted to hear. It meant peace or rest at the end of the working day. I still have that signboard from the house now. And he was president of the Cambridge Yasmi Club for many years. When I married my wife, Anne, in 1978, she got talking to him about this. Uh, this coincided with him retiring, have more time to reflect. So Anne got him to write this little booklet, really so that our children could have Dad's story. Uh, Dad himself went back to Thailand in 1988, and I've got the photos from that visit. And we ourselves went in 2010 to see, um, particularly on the Thai side of the railway, uh, the sites, the conditions they worked under. We were hoping to go back for VJ75 this year, but the COVID restrictions really mean it's not safe to do so. So we hope to go next year. And this year, uh, in, instead, uh, we will be at the National Memorial Arboretum. The, Children of the Far East Prisoners of War, which we're members of, have a memorial building there. And there's also a section of the Thai Burma Railway where Dad's ashes are spread. He died uh, six years ago, age 95. So it means a lot to us going back to there for VJ Day.